encourage you to go ahead and be taking out your Bibles to follow along this evening to test the things I have to say to see that it is by the Word of God. And if we find it to be the truth, I hope that we'll take it and apply it in our everyday walks of life. We began this morning during the Bible class period a study of the topic of prayer. And we talked about the need to pray this morning during the Bible class period. And during the worship period to follow, we talked about the contents of our prayer. Tonight we'll talk about how we pray. Next week we'll talk about some assumptions that are made about prayer. There are some things we naturally assume about prayer. For example, if what I pray for does not happen, then the answer must automatically be no. Sometimes the answer is not right now. And so we'll talk about some of those assumptions that are made about prayer next week. And then the, the, the week after that, we'll finish the series and conclude by talking about some things that can hinder our prayer. First Peter 3, 7 talks about things that hinder our prayers. And what are some of those? Again, we talked this morning about the need to pray. We said this morning in the Bible class hour, we need to pray because it is commanded. We're commanded to pray without ceasing. We're commanded to pray for others. We, we need to pray because it is how we communicate to God. It's the raising of the voices together to God. It's in the Lord's presence. It's a prayer or petition. It's to the Lord, and it is before the God of heaven. We talked about how prayer helps in the time of need, whether that's the time of trial, where we can pray for boldness or for wisdom, or we pray that God's will ultimately be done. Prayer can help in the midst of temptations. We can pray to avoid the temptation. We can pray for that grace to help in the time of need, according to Hebrews 4, 14, and 16. And we can pray that ultimately our faith not fail, and that we can pray and cast our cares upon Him, no matter the need that we have, whether it's a physical need or it's a need such as trials and temptations, we can cast our cares upon Him knowing He cares for us. And then we saw all about the importance of spiritual growth. Prayer helps in our spiritual growth such as Paul's prayer in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12, where he prays for the spiritual growth of the brethren there. And he mentions several things pertaining to spiritual growth, such as filled with knowledge and walking worthy, being fruitful or increasing in knowledge. And we said we need to offer a prayer like that. Then we saw this morning about the contents of prayer, and we said that the contents of prayer are made up of supplications, we looked at the definition of that, how it's an entreaty made to God, an urgent request made or addressed exclusively to God, according to BDAG, and how it's a wanting or a needing, an asking or an entreaty, according to Vines. We looked at the use of that passage in our Scripture. It was, it was a supplication that Paul offered in Romans 10 and in verse 1, where his desire was for Israel that they be saved. It was a supplication that's mentioned in Philippians 4, along with prayer, as to why we don't need to be anxious. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man of James 5 was a supplication, and the ears of the Lord are open to the supplications of the righteous. We then talked about prayer, that more generic term that includes everything else, how it's the prayer the apostles were devoted to in Acts 6, how it was the kind of prayer we're told to be constant in in Romans 12, and it's the kind of prayers that Paul was offering for the brethren. We talked about intercessions. It's talked there in Second Timothy chapter, or First Timothy chapter two. How it's a prayer for forgiveness on the behalf of another. It's a prayer like like Peter offers for Simon in Acts eight, and that's in keeping with James five sixteen, where we pray for those that confess their trespasses. And then we concluded by talking about the giving of thanks and how we're thankful for things such as the food that we eat. We're thankful in everything. Because ultimately, every blessing has come for God, and we're thankful for every one. But tonight, we want to look at the idea of what it means about how we pray. The Scriptures don't just tell us what our prayers are made up of, but it tells us how we need to pray. So let's consider for a few moments how the Bible tells us we need to pray. The first of those we looked at briefly this morning is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and in verse 17, if you'll be turning with me there. Again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning back at about verse 12. Beginning at verse 12 and going on through verse 22 is some various exhortations. And one of those exhortations is found in verse 17, where we're told to pray without ceasing. What does that mean? 
that I pray without ceasing. I know that I'm commanded that my prayer is to be without ceasing, but what does that really mean? According to BDAG, the Greek word rendered ceasing means to be constantly or unceasingly. Remember the passage we, we saw a few weeks ago in Romans chapter 12? Well, in Romans chapter 12 and in verse 12, it said to rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Or the ESV said to be constant in prayer. You know, the way that we pray is not that we just offer a prayer from time to time, but the prayers in our life need to be constant. They're unceasing. Think about Daniel for just a moment. Think about Daniel in Daniel chapter 6. Where in Daniel chapter 6, there are those that want to do him harm. And in Daniel chapter 6, they're trying to find something wrong with Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 6, as they come, and they're trying to figure out what can we entrap him with. Remember, he was was the favorite, and, and they wanted to find a way. And they have this plot against Daniel. But I think it's an important point in verse 5 of Daniel chapter 6 where it says, these men said, we shall find, not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And they said of Daniel, we're not going to find a charge against him unless it pertains to his God. This man, this man is very careful to make sure that he keeps the law. But drop down to verse 10 of Daniel chapter 6. Your Bible is open to Daniel 6. Drop down to verse 10. Remember that they, in verses 6 through verse 9, have had this law signed into effect that says that they're only to pray to Darius, to King Darius. Now look at verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room in his windows open toward, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Listen, as was his custom since early days. Here he goes and he prays three times that day with his windows open towards Jerusalem. That tells me first and foremost that Daniel was not ashamed even though he knew the fact that the law was signed into effect. Not just because he prayed to God, but he prayed with his windows open as he always had. He didn't hide in a closet and pray. But he prayed with his windows open as he always had three times that day as was his custom since his early days. You know what we could say about Daniel? Daniel's prayers were unceasing. Daniel was somebody that was constant in prayer. That's what we're told to be, is constant in prayer. Is prayer one of those things that we do at certain times because we feel that we have to pray? We have to pray before we eat. Maybe we have to pray first thing in the morning or we have to pray before we go to bed. We we have to pray at certain times. But are we being constant in prayer? Being constant in prayer includes more than just saying a prayer and having sort of a schedule, if you will. Daniel prayed three times a day. But it's not just the the praying, uh, you know, I have a schedule, I'm going to pray at this time of day, and this time of day, and this time. I've got it sort of figured out, I'm going to say prayer at this time. Being constant in prayer is praying, not because we have to, but if we're truthfully being unceasing in our prayers, we're praying to God because we want to spend time in prayer. If we're truthfully being constant in prayer, then prayer doesn't feel like something I have to do in a burden. Prayer is something that I want to do. So the question that we really want to raise is, are we praying constantly or without ceasing? Am I being unceasing or constant in my prayer? Because this is, this in, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is not Paul giving a suggestion. We saw that this morning when we talked about prayer as a command. 
It's not a suggestion. We are commanded to be constant in prayer in Romans 12 and to pray without ceasing here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Is my prayer life a prayer life that can be described as constant and unceasing or do I pray simply because I feel I have to, not because I want to pray? I'll tell you the second thing we know about how we need to pray. We need to pray without losing heart. Go to Luke 18. Go to Luke 18. We're going to read the story of Luke 18. And then we want to, we want to talk about this story. But Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Then he said, both, beginning at verse 1, a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not to lose heart. That right there is just a summary of what this parable is about. We're going to talk about that in a second. But let's get the parable and then we'll come back and talk about some lessons we learned. Pick up with me in verse 2. Saying there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while... But afterward, he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubled me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith. Will he really find faith? On earth. Luke 18 is the parable of the widow and the unjust judge. Well, we're familiar with this parable. The parable that men ought always to pray and never to lose heart. But I think there's something we need to understand before we go any farther. This judge that is talked about in Luke 18 is not a representative of God. Sometimes when a parable is told, there may be something that represents God. For example, when you read the prodigal son, that's what the father is representing. But the unjust judge here is not representing God. In fact, the point of this parable is this. If an unjust judge, a man who has no fear of God, a man who does not regard man, is willing to listen to this widow who is persistent in her coming to him, who is persistent in the asking of him to get justice for her from her adversaries, then how much more will your heavenly Father, who is righteous, listen to your prayers? Now we need to pray without losing heart. This, this widow, though she comes to this judge time and time again, is not given peace from her adversaries. She's not given justice from them. But she continues to come to the judge and she continues to ask him to get her justice from her adversaries. Time and time again. And finally, the judge does give her justice from her adversaries. When we go to God in prayer, and we'll talk about this next week more when we talk about the assumptions that we make in prayer, but sometimes when we come to God in prayer, we pray to God that something happens, and what I pray for doesn't happen just like that, and I think, well, then what's the point? Why is it that I spend time in prayer? God didn't answer my prayer. But we're praying without losing heart. The prayers need to be... Part of prayer being constant is that the prayer is without losing heart. I think we've got to understand that sometimes God, when He answers our prayers, is not saying no. God is simply saying, not right now. We pray to God that something happens and it doesn't happen just like this. And we think we automatically just assume the answer is no. Think about Zechariah and Elizabeth. As the book of Luke opens up, it's not on the board, but go to the Luke chapter 1. Zacharias and Elizabeth, they were both righteous before God, according to verse 6 of Luke chapter 1, walking in all His commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. 
And they were both well advanced in years. You see, the description of them here is they are well advanced in years. And she's barren. I would take it at this point, them being described as well advanced is they're not only was she barren and they never had children, they're well past the age of childbearing at this point. Listen to the description. Verse 8. So it was while he, that is, Zacharias, was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of his priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense, and he went into the temple of the Lord, and the whole multitude of the people was praying outside of the house of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you shall call his name John. Now we'll go through Luke 1 next week in more detail when we talk about the assumption that, that when it doesn't happen, the answer is no, versus the answer being not right now. But I want you to understand this. Zacharias and Elizabeth have prayed for this, and they've probably prayed for this time and time and time again. And God's answer to them was not no, God's answer was not right now. But we need to continue in prayer. If we pray for something and it doesn't happen the first time or two we pray for it, we have a tendency to just sort of lose heart and to give up. But the point of Luke 18, and according to Luke 18 and in verse 1, is that we ought always to pray and never to lose heart. We can spend time in prayer to God and our prayer might not be answered right now, but the prayer may be answered at some We're constant, when we're being constant in prayer and we're praying without losing heart. I guess the question then that we really need to ask is, is my prayer life a prayer life that could be described as one that doesn't lose heart? When God doesn't answer the prayer the way I want it to be answered right now, do I continue in prayer or do I lose heart? How's my prayer life? Is it a prayer life of one that isn't losing heart? that continues in prayer even when what I prayed for didn't happen the first or maybe the second or even the third time? Do I lose heart or do I continue to pray? Let's make sure, brethren, we're not losing heart. When the prayer is not answered the way we wanted the first time, sometimes God's answer is not right now. Let me tell you a third thing about the way we need to pray. We need to pray boldly. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. We went to this passage this morning in Hebrews chapter 4 when we talked about the fact that we could find mercy and grace to help in the time of need. But I want you to look at Hebrews 4 and verse 14. Hebrews 4 and verses 14 through 16 are dealing with Christ as our high priest. He's a superior high priest. And the text is going to point out several reasons or several aspects, first and foremost, of Christ high priest. His priesthood that shows him to be a superior high priest. Now let's look at what it means that, what it is that makes him a superior high priest, and let's see if we can't figure out what the application, see what the application is in this text. Let's pick up in verse 14. Seeing then we have a great high priest who passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. First and foremost, we have a high priest who passed through the heavens. Remember in the book of Job, as Job is going through his trials and he's sort of questioning God and God is making the point about, you know, asking Job these questions to prove the point of who are you to question me. Job makes this point basically, this is a paraphrase, but basically the question is, God, I wish there was somebody that could stand between me and you who could see it from your point of view, but see it from my point of view. Somebody that can see what it's like to be a man, but at the same time see what it's like to be God. We have that. Here's Jesus who's passed through the heavens. Jesus knows what it's like to be God because He is God. He's been in heaven. He's Jesus, the Son of God. But not only has He passed through the heaven, He can sympathize with us. Look at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us. When it means that we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us is we have a high priest who can. Here's why. Look again in verse 15. He was tempted in all points as we are. 
He was tempted in all points as we are. I don't think that means that Jesus was tempted with every single sin, but Jesus was tempted through all the avenues of temptation. We go to 1 John chapter 2 and we look at, look at the avenues of temptation and what's talked about in 1 John, in the book of 1 John chapter 2, where it talks about the love of the world, or, or the, do not love the world or the things of the world, for the love of the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not saying here that Jesus is tempted in every single sin, but Jesus was tempted by all the avenues of sin. By all the ways of temptation, all the ways that we can be tempted. Those three ways we read about in 1 John chapter 2 and in verses 16 and 17, He was tempted in all points as we are. He's had to deal with temptation that appealed to each of those things just as we do. Yet, He did so without sin. Jesus has been tempted just as you and I have been tempted, but Jesus... Did was tempted and yet did not sin. That's what made him the perfect sacrifice. Because he was tempted as you and I are tempted. Because he was fully God and yet he was fully man. And when he comes in the form of man and he is tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Now here's why that's important. And here's the point the Hebrew writers tried to make. Look at verse 16. Let us therefore... Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. You know, we spend time in prayer. We have a mediator who has been tempted as we are, who knows what it's like to be man, yet he knows what it's like to be God. And so we can come boldly to the throne of grace because we have that perfect mediator. We looked this morning at 1 Timothy chapter 2. At 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we looked at verses 1 and 2, and what he talks about is what we are to pray for, but I want you to to be turning there and look at verse 3. Pick up in verse 3 with me. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, verse 3, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 3. Now we're in verse 4. Who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. We have the perfect mediator in Jesus Christ because Jesus can say, listen, I know what it's like to be man. I know what it's like to be tempted. I know what it's like to face the trials that man faces. I know what it's like to be discouraged. Yet he did so with, and he was sinless. Despite the fact that he faced temptation, he was able to withstand the temptation. And it makes him the, and he is able to, and he is God. And so he's able to be the perfect mediator between God and man. So knowing that Christ is our mediator, knowing that He is the perfect high priest, knowing that He knows what it's like to be in our position, then we can pray with boldness. For He has been, that should say, He has been where we are. It's not that Jesus doesn't know what it's like, because He does. And that makes Him the perfect mediator because He can say, listen, I know what it's like to face temptation. I know what it's like to feel that need. Remember, he prayed in the garden the night before that this cup passed from him. Yet, he prayed ultimately that the Lord's will be done. When he prays there, facing that trial, he knew what he was about to go through But he prayed, even though in the face of that trial, that God's will be done. He knows what it's like to face adversity. He knows what it's like to face temptation. And so that makes him the perfect high priest. And because of that, we can pray boldly. The question is, are we praying boldly? You think about it. We talked this morning about how, how we're able to, to pray to the, we're able to talk to the creator of all the world. You think about the way that God is described throughout the Bible. 
And all the things that God has done for us, as we talked about this morning, we talked about the giving of thanks in prayer. And despite all of that, we can come and we can pray to God and we can do so with boldness because of Jesus Christ. Are we praying with boldness? The last thing I want us to look at this evening is the fact that our prayers need to be prayers that are not with doubting. Our prayers need to be without doubting. Go to James 1. We've been there already this morning in our studies. We talked about praying for wisdom, but let's go there again. James chapter 1. James 1, James is opening his epistle by discussing the benefits of trials. That's something that at times may seem like a foreign concept to us, that that trials could have benefit, which is why we saw this morning we need to pray for wisdom. We pray for wisdom that we might see the benefits of the trials that we are undergoing. But when James is opening up his epistle... He comes in verse 5, as we talked about this morning, and says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. You need to ask for wisdom. If you lack wisdom, you can come to God and you can pray for wisdom. But, look at verse 6. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all his ways. You know, when we come to God and we ask God for something, we can pray to God knowing that He hears our prayers if we're serving Him faithfully. Knowing that He can, He will answer in the best way possible for us. I might not know what that is, but God is always going to answer in the best way for me. Paul prayed that the thorn in the flesh be removed. He thought that what was best was that the thorn of the flesh be removed. He prayed three times, and God told him, no, God answers in the best way possible. But, at times, I'm afraid, we may pray to God, and we may feel like, well, I'm praying for this, but we feel almost like we're taking a shot in the dark. Maybe, just maybe, this could happen. Maybe. We're praying to God and we're asking God for something, but we're asking and yet at the same time we're doubting that it's really going to happen. We pray to God and in the back of our mind it's like, yeah, but I don't think that's going to happen. Our prayers can be with doubting. We've got to be aware of that and make sure that when we're praying to God, we're praying to God knowing that He can answer our prayers and He will answer them in the very best way possible. Yes, what I ask for may not be the answer that I get. It may be like Paul that I ask that the thorn in the flesh be removed as Paul did. Paul's request that the thorn in the flesh be removed, and God said no. But Paul asked for that thorn in the flesh to be removed, whatever it was, and he asked knowing God could remove it and would remove it if it was what was best for Paul. Now, unlike Paul in First Corinthians and Second Corinthians chapter twelve, rather, we're not told specifically that God's going to come and tell us no or yes, or not right now. But we need to be aware of the fact that when we pray to God, we need to pray knowing that He will answer our prayers if we're serving Him faithfully. The ears of the Lord are open to the prayers of the righteous. Remember James 5 and verse 16. We've been there several times before. Let's turn there again. James 5 and verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray to one another that you may be healed. Look at picking up the last half and going through verse 17 and 18. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now here's an example. There's a, there's a statement made. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. Or prayer has great power as it's working, the ESV would say. Now here's an example of that. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again 
And the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. If we begin to question whether God will answer, and we begin to doubt in our prayers, will God really answer? Remember, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, yet he prayed to God that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three years and six months. And then he prayed to God again that it would rain, and it did. The effective, fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. When we get that in our minds, that's going to help us in our prayers because when I'm coming to pray, I'm going to understand that I don't have to doubt. That my prayer doesn't have to be with timidity. That I don't have to pray like maybe, just maybe, God will answer my prayer. But I know that God will answer my prayers and even if it's not how I want it answered, it'll be in the very best way possible. And you know, the two really go hand in hand, this and boldness. If we're praying boldly, then we're going to understand that God is going to answer. But if we are doubting that God is going to answer, then we can't pray boldly. How can I say that I'm boldly praying? And yet at the same time, in the back of my mind, be thinking, well, I don't know that God's going to answer this the way that I want. We can't be praying boldly and yet doubt at the same time. Our prayers have to be without doubt. The question really is, do we ask God for something? And yet doubt that He will receive the prayer? Yet doubt that He will answer in the very best way possible? That may be hard at times when we pray for something again and again and we continue to pray. You know, and really that's closely connected to the idea of not losing heart. Uh, Sometimes we pray to God and what I prayed for wasn't answered right now and so I begin to lose heart and as I begin to lose heart, my prayers are not as bold and though they're not as bold, I begin to doubt. And when all that begins to happen, then I might begin to question the power of prayer and if it's really doing any good, and I'm not going to be praying without ceasing. I'm not going to be as constant in my prayers because I begin to doubt. So really, this is sort of a domino effect. These four things go hand in hand. If I'm praying without ceasing, then I'm going to make sure that even if how what I want is not answered the way that I want it, that I continue to pray without losing heart. And when I'm praying without losing heart, then I can remain bold in my prayers, even though what I want may not be what I've received, and I'm going to continue to pray without doubting. But if I begin to doubt, then I'm going to become less bold. I'm going to start losing heart, and my prayers are going to become less and less. And my prayers aren't going to be as constant as God would have them to be. That is how we pray. Without ceasing, without losing heart, boldly, and without doubting. Again, we've already seen the need to pray. We've already seen the contents of our prayer and how we pray. Next week, we'll talk about those assumptions about prayer. And some of the things we've hit on tonight, we'll talk about in some more detail next week when we talk about the assumptions we make about prayer. And I think as we start to look at some of those next week, it'll help us fulfill how we pray as we begin to go through those assumptions and realize that what we sometimes think about prayer is not really true and how we sometimes view it. It may be that there is present this evening one or more that have never responded in obedience to the gospel. You're not guaranteed another opportunity. Life is but a vapor that appears for a short time and then vanishes away. But you have an opportunity right now that you're not guaranteed to ever have again. And that is you have the opportunity to respond in obedience to the gospel. So if you're here and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that He came, He lived, and He died, and He rose that third day, that you might have that hope of heaven and the forgiveness of your sins, then why would you wait? As as, as Saul of Tarsus was asked, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Maybe you're here and you've done that, but somewhere along the line you've not lived as you should. Then if it's of a private nature, take it to God in prayer. If it's of a public nature, we'll pray with you and for you for God to forgive you. But no matter what your need is, if we can assist you in any way, would you not come forward as together we stand and as we sing.